Hello everyone. I'd like to greet you in Jesus' name. It's a real honour and I'm humbled to have been invited to prepare and present this sermon by the General Conference Department of Women's Ministries. I'm really excited to explore the Bible with you today and to find inspiration, healing and hope as we meditate upon Jesus and his ministry. This sermon has the title, When Jesus Ended It. For 18 years, the woman had suffered. Standing up with a straight spine was a distant, faded memory. She probably longed to look into her children's faces, to see their eyes sparkle, but all she could see was the floor. In her small cottage, she would have liked to have stored her food on a higher shelf, but she couldn't reach a higher shelf, so she did her best to keep the rodents away from her supplies at lower levels. No doubt she longed to see a majestic blue sky with white puffy clouds gently sailing, suspended in space. Or to look up into the night sky and see stars and a full rounded moon glowing gloriously in the heavens. Instead, her natural field of view was perpetually downward, confined to seeing the dry barren paths of the Middle East and the rubbish left behind by animals. For 18 years, she had suffered with this condition. There was no relief. There was no time out. There was no break. People had forgotten her face. They only saw the top and the back of her head. And rather than being seen as a person, she was a nuisance. At best, someone to pity. For 18 years, she had gone to the synagogue each Sabbath. It wasn't easy to go to the synagogue because walking was difficult and when she did arrive, there was no real welcome from the leaders. Getting there, being there was a challenge. But each Sabbath, she persevered and she went to the synagogue in faith and in hope. And then one Sabbath, a visitor was at the synagogue and he changed everything. He ended it. He healed her and his name is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. The only account of the Sabbath healing of the bent over woman is in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. But before we explore this amazing event, we need to invest a few moments looking at the broader context of Luke's gospel. Jesus is the star of Luke's gospel. It's all about Jesus. And what a wonderful star he is. Jesus and his ministry, his whole mission, is revealed to us in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. I'd like you to take your Bibles with me right now and turn to Luke chapter 4. And we're going to read from verses 16 to the end of verse 19. And it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus returned to his home village of Nazareth after being baptized by his cousin John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible is very clear that Jesus had a custom of attending the synagogue on Sabbath. Clearly, the Sabbath was important to Jesus. He didn't occasionally visit the synagogue on Sabbath. It was his regular habit to attend. This event at Nazareth also reveals more about Jesus' values. One of Jesus' important values is teaching. Jesus is shown by Luke as wanting people to be informed, to be aware of the big issues of life, the major issues of the age. Jesus doesn't want people to stay in the dark, to stay in the lowlands of ignorance. His desire is that people will be enlightened. So Jesus freely taught the people, but what did he teach them? Jesus taught the scriptures. 
This is the first record we have of Jesus' teaching. And the very first thing out of his mouth when he taught the people in Nazareth was from the Bible. Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 61. Clearly, the Bible was important to Jesus and it was foundational to his teachings. So far from this event at Nazareth, we've discovered first that Jesus has the highest regard for the Sabbath. His life was molded around his custom of attending the synagogue each Sabbath. The second detail that emerges from the text is that teaching from the Bible and the Bible itself was also very significant to Jesus. The third important detail we discover from this Nazareth Sabbath teaching event is the love that Jesus has for people. Notice the emphasis of Jesus' biblical teaching at Nazareth. Good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. All of Jesus' teaching at Nazareth revolves around ministering to others, particularly the impoverished, the hostages, the physically disabled and the victims of oppression. And because the Spirit was upon Jesus, he wasn't just speaking platitudes or offering vain hope. He was empowered to act and to rescue people from dire circumstances. In the New Testament era, women were overrepresented among the poor, suffering, captives and oppressed. Typically, women didn't have a very high place in society. In fact, it's difficult to exaggerate how low their position was and how great their misery. But Jesus uplifted women. Jesus ministering to the bent over woman of Luke 13 is just one example. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13, verse 10, as we explore this wonderful story in more detail. So we're looking for Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 10. And it says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Jesus paused on his journey to Jerusalem at this unnamed location for Sabbath to attend the synagogue, to teach and to heal. Luke, by not naming the location, nor the woman, broadens the application and significance of this event beyond this one individual woman to all women who are in bondage in all places and in all subsequent eras. This beautiful story offers hope to all victims. Luke, with the tenderness of a physician, describes the severity of her condition. She was bent over and unable to straighten up. And what's more, she had endured this 
for 18 long, miserable years. That's a long time to suffer. Have you ever made a journey, a long journey in a bus or a car and had very limited space for the duration of that journey? You know what it's like to be confined, restricted, unable to stretch out for the length of that journey. You know what it's like to arrive at your destination and to stand tall and to stretch and to feel your body coming back to life again. But this poor woman had been on this painful journey for 18 years and there was no sight of her destination. Day and night, she was unable to straighten up. Even lying on her bed at night, she was bent up. Even in her sleep, this misery never left her. Imagine her prolonged suffering. Bible students have speculated the specific disease or ailment she was inflicted with. John Wilkinson regards spondylitis ankylopietica as the most likely malady. Others suggest this woman, described by Luke, showed symptoms consistent with some women who have suffered from male sexual abuse or violence. This is entirely possible. Ultimately, Jesus laid the blame of her suffering upon Satan. We read that in verse 16. Essentially, the point is that there is nothing Christ-like about sexual abuse of women. It is the work of Satan. There is nothing redeeming about inflicting violence upon women. These acts of violence are also the work of the evil one. It goes without saying that no genuine Christian man would sexually force himself on a woman, not even his wife. No genuine Christian man would beat a woman, any woman, especially the one he promised to love as his wife. This type of behavior is totally at odds with the teaching and values of Jesus. No man who claims to have Christ residing in his heart would do anything that would belittle, bully, or cause pain to a woman, whether that be physical, mental, emotional or psychological pain. When Jesus came to that synagogue on that Sabbath, everything changed. He taught wonderful and beautiful things from the Bible. Then, out of the crowd, Jesus saw her. Even though she was bent over and probably shorter than everyone else in the building, the Bible says that Jesus called her. It's important to note that this woman was obedient to the call of Jesus. Though her body was disabled, faith was alive and well in her heart. We can imagine her making her way with difficulty as best as she could, arriving before Jesus, still stooped over. She had done exactly what Jesus had asked her to do. Then Jesus said the most wonderful words she'd ever heard in her life. Woman, you are freed from your disability. And then the Bible says that Jesus touched her. And we can be sure that it was an appropriate and a loving touch from the Savior. The Bible makes sure that we catch this next important point. Immediately, she was made straight. Jesus had ended it. Jesus had stopped her physical pain. She was free. This was her good news. She was liberated from a captivity. Now she could see more than the floor. Her physical oppression was over. She was experiencing the Lord's favor. All that Jesus had promised in his teaching at Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 19, was coming true for her. Jesus' teaching was and is real. As a result of the ministry of the Creator, her body was becoming what it originally had intended to be, healthy and upright. She could now look into people's faces. Her joy would have been unlimited. Now she could look into the face of Jesus 
the one who ended her bodily pain. And what a wonderfully kind face he had. Jesus' face was probably the first face she saw as she stood tall for the first time in 18 years. Upon being miraculously healed, the very first thing she does, according to verse 13, she glorified God. Of all the Sabbath miracles in Luke, she was the first and the only healed person to praise God when she was set free from her infirmity. Just as she had done nothing to deserve her 18 years of suffering, she had done nothing to earn or to buy or to deserve this healing. She was healed only by the grace of Jesus. For this reason, she glorified God. And by glorifying God, she was letting the world know what she thought of Jesus. But, but, while her physical pain and her physical health had been restored, her psychological torment wasn't finished. Also in the crowd that Sabbath was the synagogue ruler. He was not impressed with what was happening in his synagogue. He was indignant. The synagogue ruler and his supporters, who remained silently in the background, were most likely numerically small, but hierarchically influential. A synagogue ruler was a powerful person because he often financed the construction of the synagogue, giving him a quasi-ownership of the synagogue. A synagogue ruler held a prestigious position in the community. His high level of authority empowered him to conduct worship and to determine who participated during the Sabbath services. A synagogue ruler also most likely offered interpretations of the Torah for the people. In his indignation, the synagogue ruler blurts out, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Not all synagogue rulers were negative or bad, but this one was. His angry outburst was loaded with multiple barbs. Clearly, he was using the Sabbath as a weapon against Jesus and against the woman. He even quoted a portion of the Sabbath commandment of the Decalogue in his attack upon Jesus and the recently healed woman. This is a technique often used by people who abuse others. They frequently take the words of Scripture and distort them for their evil purposes. Satan did this when tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And the Apostle Peter warns in 2 Peter 3, chapter, chapter 3, verses 15 to 16, there are some things in them, that's Paul's writings, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. The Bible is not a tool to be used to justify the abuse of women. When the Bible is correctly read, we see that it uplifts women to their rightful God-given status. By attempting to correct Jesus, this synagogue ruler is also claiming to be holier than Jesus. His retort implies that he would never pollute the Sabbath by healing on Sabbath. His response that there are six days on which work ought to be done also implies that he knew this woman, this woman or at least that he knew of her. It's difficult to imagine that if this was her first time to attend this synagogue, or if she was unknown to the synagogue ruler, that he would have said these words. Because his words implied this disabled woman is always around. She's always in the village. Everyone knows her. She isn't hard to find. In other words, he was saying, heal her any time, but not on Sabbath. Instead of celebrating this wonderful healing of Jesus when the woman's physical pain ended, 
The synagogue ruler was arguing that she should never have been healed on Sabbath. Could he even be saying that Jesus should return her to her disabled condition, repent, and then heal her again on another day of the week? Was Jesus breaking the Sabbath by healing this woman or any other person on the Sabbath? No is the only answer. Jesus did nothing on Sabbath to desecrate the holiness of the day. Ending the misery of a woman on Sabbath is not breaking the Sabbath. It's observing the Sabbath in its truest form. Ellen White offers us some valuable insights in Prophets and Kings regarding Jesus and the Sabbath. We notice these words from page 183. Christ, during his earthly ministry, emphasized the binding claims of the Sabbath. In all his teaching, he showed reverence for the institution he himself had given. In his days, the Sabbath had become so perverted that its observance reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men rather than the character of God. Christ set aside the false teaching by which those who claimed to know God had misrepresented him. Although followed with merciless hostility by the rabbis, he did not even appear to conform to their requirements, but went straight forward, keeping the Sabbath according to the law of God. Ellen White is correct. Jesus is the creator of the Sabbath. He knows how to observe his holy day. The synagogue ruler failed to recognize Jesus' true identity, his divine identity. When Luke recorded Jesus' response to the synagogue ruler, Luke helps his reading audience recall the true identity of Jesus. Notice Luke chapter 13, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord answered him. The Lord. This title reminds readers of Jesus' own words recorded in Luke chapter 6 and verse 5. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, as Lord of the Sabbath, answered this critical, demeaning synagogue ruler and his silent supporters with, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to, to water and to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus put this woman abuser in his rightful place. He, along with his ilk, were correctly identified as hypocrites. They were hypocrites because they showed more compassion to animals even an unclean animal like a donkey, than they did to a woman who was a daughter of Abraham, a person who was created in the image of God. The synagogue ruler and his allies would not allow a beast to go for a few hours on Sabbath without being released and allowed to drink its fill. However, they were outraged that a woman's suffering of 18 years was not extended for at least another day. Yes, it is true. This woman was not in any danger of dying. Jesus was not saving her from impending death by healing her on that Sabbath. But Sabbath is not just about saving life. It's about enhancing life. It should also be said that liberating women who are victims of abuse and violence should not be limited to Sabbath only. No woman should endure abuse, be it sexual, physical, psychological or emotional, on any day of the week. And any day of the week is a good day for abuse to end. Prevention of abuse doesn't need to be confined to Sabbath, nor to a specific Sabbath. While this woman's physical suffering was ended by the physical healing provided by Jesus, 
The synagogue ruler was extending her spiritual and emotional suffering with his heartless attitudes and words. It is for this reason that some of the strongest and most direct words we have in the Bible were directed against this man who had a privileged position. The synagogue ruler had the option of rejoicing with this healed woman, but he opted to unnecessarily prolong her victimization. Not only did Jesus come to the support of the healed woman, he aligned himself with her. By designating her as a daughter of Abraham, Jesus also put Abraham on the side of the woman and himself. The synagogue ruler, by his opposition to the healing, was inferring that he would prefer to see the woman remain bound, bound by Satan. So the synagogue ruler found himself in the unenviable position of being on the same side as Satan, in opposition to Jesus, to the daughter of Abraham, and to Abraham himself. Some may try to dismiss the importance of the End It Now initiative. They may resort to many reasons and excuses like this synagogue ruler. They may say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a mission to proclaim the truth and that we mustn't be distracted by these social issues implying that we are watering down our message with the social gospel. Notice these important words from Ellen White in Medical Ministry. They're found on page 251. She writes, True sympathy between man and his fellow man is to be the sign distinguishing those who love and fear God from those who are unmindful of his law. How great the sympathy that Christ expressed in coming to this world to give his life a sacrifice for a dying world. His religion led to the doing of genuine medical, medical missionary work. He was a healing power. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, he said. This is the test that the great author of truth used to distinguish between true religion and false. God wants his medical missionaries to act with the tenderness and compassion that Christ would show were he in our world. We can't ignore women who are being marginalized or suffering abuse and victimization. We have an ongoing duty to protect and shield any woman in these vile circumstances. I'm so pleased that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a department of women's ministries that is represented at every level of our organization and should be represented in every congregation. I'm so glad they're facilitating this very significant initiative of End It Now. I'm so pleased that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has ADRA, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, which operates special safe sanctuaries for women and girls who've been abused, trafficked, and sold into the most satanic circumstances. In every place and in every congregation, we must end it now. How did this visit, this visit of Jesus to this synagogue end? The woman received multiple healings, physical, emotional, spiritual, and perhaps sexual. The enduring image is of a healed woman standing upright, straight, praising God. This daughter of Abraham, who had been bent over, becomes a model of all people, of all ages showing what Jesus can do with someone who's bent over or bent out of shape by Satan. Would you like Jesus to heal you, to reshape your life and your future? Perhaps there are some men 
viewing today who may be thinking about how they have treated women or a particular woman. Perhaps their attitudes towards women are not what they should be. Maybe some men viewing are coming to realize that they've been unchristlike in their treatment of women or a woman. Rather than showing Christian love, perhaps these men now see that they've been cruel and unkind. Now is the time for these men to ask Jesus for a new heart so that they will treat women the same way as Jesus treated women, with kindness, compassion and respect. Perhaps there are women viewing who identify with this bent over woman because they too are suffering. Just as Jesus healed her, Jesus can touch you with his pure love, reshaping your life and your future. Jesus' words speak to you today just as they spoke to the bent over woman. Listen as we reflect upon Luke chapter 13 verse 12 from five different versions. Woman, you are freed from your disability. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Woman, you are healed of your sickness. Woman, you're free. That Sabbath, in that village, in that synagogue, Jesus ended that woman's suffering. Jesus ended how that woman had been treated for 18 years. He ended it. Today on this Sabbath, in your place, in your church, Jesus wants to end it there too. Jesus didn't create daughters of Abraham, sisters in Christ, or mothers of Israel to be abused. It's time to end it now. Please, bear your heads with me as we pray together. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God of love, forgiveness and healing. We thank you, Lord, that you can reshape our lives. Father, at this time, I would like to pray for our communities, our churches. We pray, Lord, that our churches, our communities will be sanctuaries of safety, that they'll be havens of love where all men and women can fellowship together in safety and in purity and blessed by your love. Father, bless the men of your church. Change our hearts. Make us more like Jesus. Father, bless the mothers, the sisters, the daughters of our churches. Keep them safe. Protect us each one. Lord, we pray that your kingdom will come. We pray that Jesus will come soon. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.